Amen. We're going to go ahead and, and uh, follow with uh, what we began last week uh, on, uh, you, know, uh, you know, our plans. Amen. Our plans, you know, uh, they have to include the Lord, don't they? Amen. And everything we do, we got to have it, it uh, centered around God, don't we? Amen. And so uh, uh, just uh, backing up a little bit from last week. And uh, it says uh, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, says, And that you study to be quiet and to do your own business. You know, is one of those things where there's enough things going on that if we mind our own business, you know, uh, you'll, have, you'll have your hands full, won't you? So it says, you know, to, uh, to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly towards them, that are without, in other words, that's saying, not those that, that don't have anything, that's saying those that are outside, those that are without, and that she may have lack of nothing. So uh, moving on into, uh, into the lesson today, following up, so we need to reach everyone with the gospel. You know, we should be able, and uh, I touched on this just a little bit last week, we should be able to minister to every walk of life. Amen. We are to be able to impart this truth to everyone. Praise God. There are no big eyes and little you in the kingdom of heaven. Praise God. We're all on the same playing field. It doesn't make no money or no difference how much money you've made. It doesn't make no difference how much money you don't have. Amen. In the eyes of God, we're souls. And we're the people of God. And to everybody that will walk in the obedience of God's word, God's going to touch them and God is going to lift you up. There's nobody that ever came to the Lord, amen, that God did not pick up in some realm, some shape, some form, some fashion. Amen. There are always going to be better people when they're walking with God the Lord. Praise God. Our, stat, uh, our status in life may not be all that great. Amen. But our status with God goes a long ways. Can you say amen? Praise God. So this is our responsibility. Praise God. Everybody ought to have a right to hear the word of God. Everybody, amen, ought to feel the need, praise God, to draw closer to God and resist the devil. Amen. So we've got to have people that's able to relate to every individual, and I said it even last week. You know, when uh, when you think about uh, college students today, you know, uh, uh, brother brother Harris used to talk about said that uh, when they would come home to Kentucky and visit, said you know they lived up in Indianapolis for years and years, and said when they would come home to Kentucky. And said, you know, they'd bring uh, some of their family from Indianapolis down. And I'm not coming against Indianapolis. I'm not coming against anybody like that. You know, but, uh, uh, you know, they always let on like they knew so much more than us briars. They knew so much more than us hillbillies. They knew so much more, you know, and, you know, because they were highly educated and they was, you know, they were sophisticated and all that stuff. And Brother Harris's mom used to say, well, there comes them, uh, them uh, educated idiots. And that's just how a lot of things are. You know, they think they know so much, but the things in life that really matter, they can't get a hold of. Amen. But we've got to be able to, to move among them. That was the one thing that with King David, amen, that got the respect of all the people around about because he could move in and out among the people. Even though he was the king, even though the anointing of God was upon him, even though the blessings of God was there, amen, he was able to move in and out of the people or among the people and they had respect for him because he did not set himself up above anybody else. And we cannot afford to do that. God forbid that I would act in a way that it would cause somebody else to be lost. God forbid, amen, that I would set myself up in a way that somebody would feel like I don't care about them. God forbid that we as the people of God, amen, would treat somebody in a realm that they would not want to come back. Now God gives everybody an opportunity to make a choice. Amen. But if they walk away, praise God, I don't want it to be because of something I've done. I'm not saying I'm perfect because I'm not. I can assure you that. Ask my wife. You know, we can, we can make a surety that none of us are perfect. We may think that we are, but we ain't. 
Amen? All right, too often in the past we have shunned education. Now, I'm not against education. All three of my kids went to, uh, went to uh, uh, higher learning. Amen? No, I didn't. The day I started kindergarten was the day that death began to happen to me. I hated the first day of kindergarten. I hated the first day of middle school. I hated the first day of high school. The only day I re rejoiced was when I walked across the stage with that diploma. And when they asked me if I was going to college, are you crazy, man? No. No. No, I had enough to last a lifetime. That's how I feel about it. But the fact of the matter is, my children all went to higher education. Amen. And, and of course, Megan is a doctor today. And I, I said this last week, you know, she comes home to the Kentucky people, and she just fits right in. You know, she can talk like us, and she can, uh, she can you know, uh, just fit right into the best, you know, biggest duck in the pond. Amen. And, but when she'd go back up there in Indianapolis and now she's down in, in Knoxville and all that mess of stuff, you know, people would make fun of her because she was talking Kentucky. And so she, because she didn't want to be made fun of, she could talk sophisticated, knowing that she was just Kentucky. And so we ought to be able to reach out to people in all walks of life because there are no big eyes and little use in the kingdom of God. Amen. The day I graduated high school was the best day of my life. Amen. Until my wife come along. Well, actually, she was already my wife when I graduated. So we're going to have to back up into the first day of 1980 was the best day of my life. Amen. And then graduating high school was the next best day. But then when I found the Lord, ain't nothing can compare Amen to what the Lord done for me. He brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I'm telling you what, you ain't going to find no greater, no greater accomplishments. If, if we make heaven, amen, we've made everything. You've got to make your plans, amen, surrounding the Lord. No matter what your job, no matter what your life, no matter what you do, amen, if God is not the center of it, You've fallen short. That's just how it is. A number of prominent people in the Bible rose to high levels in their ungodly societies and yet maintained integrity. You know, now, you know, when you think about Peter, James, and John, you know, they were just fishermen. They were just common people. And, and you know, the Pharisees, and we'll deal with it here in a little bit, you know, the Pharisees, they couldn't understand how these men, these fishermen, because they were unlearned and ignorant. But they was able to tell that these men had been with Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. But then when you think about the fact that Luke was a physician in that day, he was highly educated in the learning of that day. Amen. And the Apostle Paul you know, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Amen. He, he sat under the greatest teachers. So there was influence in those days, but they still reached out. God brings people from all walks of life. Amen. But the one thing that we know for sure, if we gain the whole world and we lose our soul, you've lost everything. Amen. So let's think about the fact that, that uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all of these were highly learned individuals. And the Bible says that, that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, he wanted people that was highly educated so that they could operate in the kingdom. But when it all boiled down, all the other highly educated people, the, the sorcerers and the magicians and, and all the ones that had all of the learning of the Chaldeans and all that, amen, none of them was able to compare to Daniel. None of them was able to compare to, to the three Hebrew children. Amen. Why? Because when God's hand is upon you, you've got the greatest thing that you can ever possibly grasp. 
And those three Hebrew boys said, we're not going to bow down to your idols. We're not going to succumb to your spirits. We're not going to give in, amen, to your way of life, amen. And they stood out, and when the test of time come, amen, they was not relying on the Lord that he was going to bring them out. They was not doing that, but the one thing they was relying on, amen, was the fact that their God was able to do it. But they had it made up in their mind that they was not going to bow down. And even if the Lord did not deliver them, amen, they was not going to succumb to the pressures of the world. Daniel did not succumb. The Bible says he purposed in his heart to not be defiled by the king's meat. He purposed in his heart, amen, he wasn't going to let the worldliness of that day, amen, get its hooks into him. And because of that, God gave him favor. And that's the one thing that you can count on. Amen. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. But even if he doesn't do it, amen, we got to settle it in our heart. We're not going to be defiled by this world. Now God uses ministers in different ways according to his purpose. Now, I said this last week, amen, concerning, you know, each and every one of us have got ministries. It may not be a pulpit ministry, amen, but there are helps. There's various types of ministry, but each and every one of us are called to be witnesses. Praise God. So, uh, on beyond your job, you're a witness. Amen. On beyond your schooling, you're a witness. On beyond your lifestyle at home, you are a witness. Your first and for foremost calling is to be a witness unto the Lord. Praise God. When people see you, they're going to see Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. The more we go through the trials, the more we go through the fire, the more we go through the situations, the more transparent we become that they no longer see us. They see the Lord working in us, the hope of glory. Praise God. You've got to make your plans in life. Hallelujah. According to the will of God in your life. Amen. As long as you're submitting yourself therefore unto God and resisting the devil, the devil's going to flee from you. But when you're drawing nigh unto God, then you're saying, God, whatever you have need of, God, whatever you want me to do, God, wherever it is you want me to go, wherever it is, Lord God, you would have me, hallelujah, to follow. Here am I, Lord. Use me. That's got to be the plan of God in your life. Amen? So, the Galilean apostles were considered ignorant and unlearned by the religious elite in Jerusalem, yet they powerfully established the New Testament. I'll never forget years ago, Brother Peebler was talking about that. You know, when he went to the Danville church, there was men that was in that Danville church that were very studious in the Word of God. And Brother, Brother Peaver would be quick to tell you, you know, that he wasn't very educated. He would, he would tell you that, you know, that, that he struggled. He was raised up in the ghettos of Cincinnati. He would tell you all these things. He said, and these men that studied the Word of God day in and day out, and they could quote it forwards and backwards and in the middle and back, uh, back out to each side. Amen. You know, and they knew the Word of God forwards and backwards. And he said it began to intimidate him. And he said one day he was praying because you know, uh, he was fellowshiping with these guys, and here, here he was a preacher. And he said, and the Lord spoke to him. He said, here's the thing. He said, I've called you to preach my word. These other men, they weren't, they weren't preachers. They were ministers of God's word, but they weren't preachers. And he said, the Lord spoke to him and said, I've called you to preach. And he said, the difference is, is the anointing. It's the anointing of God that makes a difference in our life no matter how many other people are scholars when it comes to the Word of God. These apostles that stood before these highly educated people in Jerusalem, they looked at them, they'd seen that they was ignorant men, they'd seen that they were unlearned men, but they could not deny the Spirit of God that was on their lives. 
And that's going to make all the difference in your life when you're witnessing and when you're praying and when you're walking with God. The anointing is what's going to make the difference. Amen. As for how things work out, I don't care how much they've studied. When you're the man of God behind the pulpit, when you're the, when you're the minister that is witnessing to somebody, you've got something, amen, that they don't have because when God's called you to do a work, you're the anointed one. At that moment in time, I understand, amen, like I said, I only went to the 12th grade. But Sister Watson's father couldn't even read. Yet he preached the word of God with power and authority. That's what makes the difference. The anointing makes all the difference. Can you say amen? Acts chapter 4 and verse 13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Can people tell that you've been with Jesus? Amen. When you walk into the room, can they tell, amen, that you're a child of God? Can they tell, amen, that the anointing of God is upon your life? Can they tell, amen, that you've talked with Him today? You see, that's what people's got to feel. I've heard multitudes of people say the moment that they walked in the door, they felt the unction of God. Sister Chrissy was talking about a little while ago. Amen. Uh, uh, she was so thankful that the Lord had put her in her life. I know the first day she walked in there sitting back there in that pew next to Sister Jean. And I went back there and I seen the Holy Ghost was dealing with her. And I walked back there and, and Sister Chrissy thought I was going to be praying for Jean. And when I walked over, I told her, I said, you thought I was going to be praying for Jean. I said, but I want to pray for you. And when I laid my hands on her and the tears began to flow down her back, you see all the difference is the anointing of God. When you've made your plans, amen, you've submitted your will. Hallelujah. You said, whatever i got to do, hallelujah, I'm going to do it as unto the Lord. Hallelujah, whatever i got to say, I'm going to say it as unto the Lord. Hallelujah, whatever direction God calls me in my life, I'm going to do it as unto the Lord. Praise God, because we are the called out people. And we've got to make our plans. They've seen the boldness of Peter and John. Amen, hallelujah. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. We understand that it is the power of God working in us both to will and to do of His good pleasure. I'm not afraid to be a boldness. Hallelujah. I'm not ashamed to speak His word in power. I'm not ashamed. Hallelujah. To stand up and say He's my friend. He's my Father. He's my Lord. And He's my God. Hallelujah. I know what I was. Praise God. I know what He brought me out of. I know the life that He changed. Hallelujah. I know how he picked me up out of my despair. Hallelujah. I know. Hallelujah. I was going to a devil's hell and he reached down to where I was and picked me up out of my despair. My being is in him. NLT says the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men. You see, God takes ordinary men. God takes ordinary women. God takes ordinary people. It's not our education that makes the difference. Though education's good. But God can take us in whatever part of society we are in. And let us speak boldly. And it is an amazing thing when you begin to move under the unction of God. And people are amazed because they cannot deny what they feel. Amen? So it says, NLT once again says, The members of the, account, of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men who had no special training. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. 
You see, we don't have to go to seminary school. We don't have to do that. Amen. That doesn't say that Peter and John were stupid. Just because some people are ignorant, that means they don't know a particular situation. That's not a bad thing. They recognize that they were unlearned in what is politically correct. But they could not deny the boldness. They could not deny the unction. Now some people, on the other hand, are stupid. Some people don't know when to shut up. Some people don't know when to keep their mouth closed. Amen? Some people let everybody know that they're ignorant. I'm not trying to be mean here. It's just a fact. But the fact is, amen, when you got the hand of God upon you, amen, hallelujah, anybody that says, here I am, here I am, God, use me. And we allow ourselves to come under the authority and under the unction of God. Amen. And each and every one of us is a candidate to be used in the power and in the authority of God. When we decide to make, amen, our plans with Jesus in the center of it. I sang it last week. I'll sing it again. Jesus. You're the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect come from you. You're the heart of my contentment. Peace for all I do. And Jesus, you're the center of my joy. When we make him the center, amen, hallelujah, of everything that we do, praise God, that means that we're walking in the unction of his authority. We're submitting ourselves to his plan, praise God, and we make ourselves available to be used in his kingdom. And that's why we've been called in to this way. Amen? When I lost my direction... You're the compass for my way. You're the fire and light when the nights are long and cold. In sadness, you're the laughter that shatters all my fears. And when I'm all alone, your hand is there to hold. You see, that's what it matters. Amen. He's our compass. Amen. He gives us heat. Praise God. He holds our hands when we're all alone and when we feel, amen, so empty. He is the peace of God that passes understanding in us. Why would I want to walk without him? Why would I want to walk away? Hallelujah. When I know he's able to pick me up and give me strength. In the Old Testament, prophets gathered in companies, assemblies, or schools to study the Word of God. So, you know, there was a purpose. When you begin to read about Elisha, when, when the king of Samaria, you know, he said, he said, today I'm going to remove Elisha's head off of his body. The first thing people want to do is blame the preacher because they're in a, in a drought. The first thing they want to do is blame the preacher. When, uh, when things is going bad, the first thing they want to do is blame God. And so here's the king, amen, that's wanting to take Elisha's head off. And he sent, he sent the, the man that he leans upon, he sent him ahead to tell Elisha. And Elisha said, behold, so-and-so's coming. And while he was speaking, the sons of the prophets was gathered around Elisha as he was teaching them. And this is what this is speaking. There was people that studied the word of God so that they would know what was right, what was acceptable. This is one thing. My wife said it in her testimony today. 
bankers and sister, uh, sister uh, Denny and different ones, you know, they deal with money. You know, bankers don't, set, don't study counterfeit money. That's not what they study. They study the real money. And when you know what's real, you study it to the point that anything that's not real, you see that instantly. Because you know what's real. Amen. And that's what we have, amen, in the Word of God. Praise God. Because when we make our plans in God, we're studying what is real, what is truth, what is acceptable and pleasing unto God. Amen. And then when something false comes up, that's the reason y'all y'all have heard me do it so many different times. You know, you know, I was telling my son this morning, now, I'm not coming against Joe Biden, okay? Just to understand this. He makes all kinds of gaffes. All kinds. And I told my son today, I said, you know, I don't think Joe Biden is senile. I'm just going to say that. Is he presidential? No. I'm going to say that too. I don't think he's senile because he makes gaffes. Why? Because I do that all the time. When I go to call on, on Sister Watson and I can't remember her name, I say, uh, you know who you are. Sometimes we make gaffes and stuff like that. That doesn't mean we're senile. And so when we study to do that which is right, when I'm up here and I'm preaching and I teach and I teach and I teach and I teach the Word of God over and over and over, you all have heard every story I've ever to told a thousand times. You all know the punchline of every joke. You all know when the man fell down in, into the grave, you know, the one guy sitting over there in the corner, he's about to say, you'll never get out of here. And you all are like you've never, you know, like pretending like you've never heard it before, and you have a thousand times. So when I teach that and I teach it and I teach it, and you hear it over and over and over, the one time out of a thousand times that I teach that and I misquote something, that little smirk comes over your face because you just caught me in a gaff. You just caught me. You know, it wasn't intentional, but you've learned what is real. You know it forwards and backwards and in between. Amen. Why? Because you determined that you were going to put Jesus in the center of your plans. You're going to put Jesus in the center of your life. Amen. And so when something has been misquoted, you understand it. You know, once again, we were at Brother Peebler's. And, and Brother Peebler, he just preached it. Boom, 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 boom. And we had this evangelist come in, and he started saying some things that weren't right. And everybody, Brother Peebler was sitting up on the chair, and everybody in that congregation arrived, turned to look at Brother Peebler. The moment that evangelist said something wrong. Because you understand the difference in truth. And it's something that's not right. That's our responsibility. To study, to show ourselves approved unto God. Workmen that need not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen? All right, Samuel headed. I'm winding down real quick. Samuel headed one such school of the prophets. Elijah was closely associated with these students. King Jehoshaphat kindled revival throughout the country of Judah by sending princes and priests and Levites unto all of the cities to, to teach God's word to the people. Amen. That's the reason to be a pastor. The Bible says they need to be apt to teach. I've seen some preachers, amen, they can preach the house of fire. I mean, just when, when they shout jackrabbit, everybody jumps, hallelujah. And the power and the anointing of God is there, and they can't teach their way out of a wet paper bag. But to pastor, you've got to be apt to teach. You've got to be able to impart the Word of God in a way that can be understood. You've got to be able to impart the Word of God in a way that people, amen, can receive it. 
because the King James Version Bible was written in a way that a sixth grader could understand. Oh, I just can't understand that. You've got to pray and ask God to open your understanding. But the purpose is each one of you that are in here have to study to show yourself approved. But then God has given the fivefold ministry for what? The perfecting of the saints. Amen. That's not saying that's making you perfect. That's saying that's perfecting the Word of God in you. So that when, when we're standing before somebody else, we're not just... I'd like to say something, but I can't think of nothing right now. We ought to have something to say about what we believe. Amen? Praise God. Get through here just a little bit more. 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 20 says, And Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying, and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul. And they also prophesied. When people get into the presence of the Lord, the anointing of God begins to direct their lives. Amen. And the next thing you know, they're standing up and they're testifying about the great things of God. Amen. They're beginning to speak the truths. Of God's word. This is what the Lord done for me. This is how God brought me out. This is how God led me through. This is how God, you know, uh, spoke into my life. Second Kings chapter four, verse thirty-eight. We're winding down real quick. I've got two more scriptures. And Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was a dearth in the land, and the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said unto his servant, Set on the great pot, and seethe pottage for the sons. Of the prophets. What this is saying, amen. Now we understand all the rest of the story and, and the different things that was coming there, but what we've got to understand is there was people that came together, amen, for midweek Bible study. Because you can come on Sunday and you can juke and jive and worship and run and shout and dance and talk in tongues till you turn blue in the face and you can spit. And, and just dance and fall out and you can do all that mess of stuff while you're listening to the Word of God being preached. Didn't Brother Akers do a great job here Sunday? But, you know, the title of his message was, That's Just Dumb. To know what we know. Amen. So this is saying, Amen, we can come and we can shout and dance and pray and, and do all of those things on Sunday. That's cake and ice cream. That's what it is. When, woo, Jesus. And you just, you know, and the unction of God is there and the power of God is there and you're jumping straight up and telling you, oh, I just got religion, I can't sit down. And you're feeling that power and that strength and that anointing and all that mess of stuff. You know, because uh, the Word of God, when it's preached in an evangelistic style, amen, it does exactly what it's intended to do. It causes people to want to repent. It causes people to want to draw closer. It causes people, amen, to hunger and thirst. That's cake and ice cream. There's a reason why we keep our children from eating too much candy and too much cake and too much ice cream because you don't want to kill them. And so, you know, they're eating all this cake and this ice cream and stuff and they're bouncing off of the walls and, and you know, and there's nothing you can do. And they're just there. Can I have another bite? That's cake and ice cream. That hypes you up. That's what the preach word of God does. But teaching is meat and potatoes. That's supper. That beautiful song, come home, come home, it's supper time. Amen, you want to come home and eat. Amen. You know, you can't live on cake and ice cream. You can't live on candy bars. That's going to make you unhealthy, isn't it? Now, you know, you can be like the one guy that said, well, you know, when you're thinking about cake, well, it's got eggs in it. And it's got milk in it. 
And, you know, and it's got, it's got flour, you know, it's our bread and, and, you know, all that. And, you know, that's all real good stuff. Well, you eat too much of that and you just watch what happens. But you give me some, you give me a beef roast. And you give me some taters and carrots. And you give me some peas and stuff. You know, that puts meat on the bones. That's what the Word of God does. That's the reason the sons of the prophets, they all came around so that the man of God could teach because you can't live on cake and ice cream. You've got to have substance to know why we live like we live. Why we talk like we talk. Why we do the things that we do. Amen? All right, finally. Second Chronicles chapter 17, verse 7. Also in the third year of his reign, he sent to his princes, even to Benhel and to Obadiah, and Zechariah, and Nathiel, and to Machai, to teach in the cities of Judah. He sent these to be able to impart the Word of God. we got to be able to tell people a reason for what we do. But not only that, amen, if you're just sitting there and you're not telling anybody and you're not studying anything, somebody, because the devil is going to see to it, somebody will make a fool out of you if you don't have something to say that's true. And if you say something and it's not true, I will assure you they will search it out and they're going to know you're a false prophet. So you've got to tell truth. You've got to impart the gospel. Amen? Finally, this is our last scripture, and we're going to stand. 2 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 9. And they taught in Judah, and had the book of the law of the Lord with them, and went about throughout all the cities of Judah, and taught the people. What this, this is saying, amen, those that hunger and thirst, they've got a desire to learn. Don't tell me what it takes to make me feel good. Teach me what it takes to make heaven my home. Amen. I don't want to, I don't want to do it just because the preacher says to do it. There's too many, there's too many churches that are out there that are only doing it because they're a preacher. They don't even bring their Bibles to church. They're taking the word of the preacher and just hoping that he's going to lead them right. Hey, I don't want to live on hope. If you had to open this world alone, you'd be of all men most miserable. I've got to know in whom I'm believed. And I've got to keep what's been committed unto me against that day. Let's stand. Appreciate the Lord so very, very much. All God's goodness and His mercy. He is long-suffering with us. He's not willing that any of us should perish, is it? Amen. Let's go ahead and bow our heads. Lord Jesus, tonight we come into Your presence.